Welcome to the Geek Night YouTube channel. Today I am going to talk to you about API design. While there are many ways you can go about designing your APIs, like there is SOAP, there is RPC, there is REST. In this video, I am going to talk to you about REST and what are the best practices you should be following while designing your APIs using REST standard. Before we do that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing because that motivates me to create more such videos. Let's start with REST. Why REST is useful, why it can be used to design really extensible APIs that are easy to manage, easy to scale, easy to build, easy to integrate with, and why REST has such a wide acceptance in the industry. So there are some benefits that we get when we deal with RESTful APIs. The number one benefit, according to me, is its simplicity, because simplicity rocks. In this complicated world, there's so many things we can complicate. And the best thing you can do as a developer is to create simple solutions. And REST is really simple. It's simple to understand, it's simple to build, and it's simple to integrate with. So simplicity is the first benefit of REST. It is widely supported. I think it's because it's simple. There are so many tools that, that can support your REST APIs. You can test your REST APIs. You can build them easily. So everyone speaks REST. Everyone knows REST because it is such a widely accepted standard. It is flexible because it can be extended easily. You don't have to go through a lot of complexity. You can add changes. You can add new features by just extending the existing API, which makes a lot of sense because you have to add a lot of features to your product. And that's how products are evolved. It is highly scalable, mainly because it is stateless. It is meant to be stateless. So each request that you make to your REST API, it is not dependent on any of the previous requests, ideally. And that's how REST should be implemented. So each request is processed independently, which means you can scale individual requests horizontally. Now, as with any standard that you follow or you try to build on, there are some best practices. Let me list down the best practices that we are going to talk about today. First is API first approach. Second is resource orientation. Third is plural resource names. Fourth is versioning. Fifth is filtering and pagination. Now, this does not mean this is an exhaustive list of all the best practices, but this is for you to start thinking about better REST APIs. So let's talk about API first. Now, API first is not necessarily tied to REST APIs. It can be any API development, but API first is an approach where you think about the API design itself right before you even start thinking about the implementation. So don't think about the implementation. Think about the APIs, what kind of contract you want to support, what kind of contract your stakeholders want to support, and then design the APIs first. Understanding the domain, understanding the functionality you are providing is a critical aspect. You don't want to jump to implementation before you even understand the domain, understand the contract your users are expecting. So design the API first. Now, this does not mean that you can't code or you can't create prototypes. You can always do that. But the idea is you don't have to jump on the implementation or the actual implementation without designing the API first, taking feedback from stakeholders and making a concrete basic API that you are good to start with. You always have to extend your APIs because you are adding new features, your product is evolving. That's totally fine. You can't get away with that, but you have to do it incrementally while taking feedback, while addressing the feedback and improving your API. So that is the way to go. Second is resource orientation. Now, unlike RPC, in REST, you are resource oriented, which means you don't have to think about operations or the actions you're performing, but rather you, are, you have to think about resources. Whatever you do in REST, you're dealing with a resource. So everything you work with is a resource. A resource gets a URI once created, like an order. If you talk about e-commerce, you create an order, it gets a URI. The best practice or the better practice is to not create APIs like create order or update order or delete order, or get order. You don't have to do that because that is, you're specifying the operation. But instead, you have to specify the resource you want to deal with, which is orders. Now we'll talk about why it is orders and not order in a bit, but the idea is to not think about operations, but think about resources because you're dealing with resources. The next best practice is using plural resource names. Now, Let's understand why. So what do I mean by plural resource names? It's the first example is my shop product. And this doesn't map to anything because it's a product, but it doesn't have any identifier like the product ID or something. So this is kind of invalid. 
So you you try to work with collection of items like orders, customers, products, devices, configurations. And you don't want to work with single items, right? What to access or to modify or to update or to create a single item you have to deal with or you have to provide an ID. So the second example is my shop product one, two, three. So here maps to the product with ID one, two, three. This is still valid. But the problem is if you go one step above, this maps to nothing. And then you kind of create an API, which is not a standard way of, of doing things because you're dealing with collection. You're not just creating one product, but you're creating range of products or collection of items. And you think of your resources as collections, and not single items. So if we do that, you have to use plural names. So something like get my shop products, it maps to all products. So this is still valid because it gives you all the products in the, in the shop. Similarly, if you provide one to three, it's still you're in the products collection, but you want to access the product with ID one to three. So this maps to product with ID one to three. So if you get the point, it is making it easier and uniform how you design your APIs instead of dealing with something which might be invalid depending on the use case. So it's best to deal with collection of items and not a single item. And working with plural resource names works best for most cases. Now, the next one is versioning. As you go about making changes to your API. So first, the best approach is to not make any change. Create one API and that's it, you're done. But that is not the reality. You always have to add new features. You always have to make changes. And there are two types of changes you can make. One is non-breaking changes, which means existing users or the existing contract with the users does not break. But the other type of changes are breaking changes. And you don't typically want to make breaking changes because that breaks the contract with your existing users and it is not great. It can break the experience your users have. But can you guarantee you will never make changes that are breaking the API? Of course not, because products evolve, relationships change between the entities. So you have to make changes that might break certain contracts with the user. So to avoid that or to deal with it in a very nice manner, you have to go with versioning. So to avoid breaking changes to the same API, it is recommended to use versioning to make changes explicit. So the client knows what version they are dealing with. If they are on, on an older version, they can expect something else. If, you're, if they want to upgrade, they can upgrade to the newer version and expect the new functionality. So there are many ways actually to deal with versioning, but let's talk about URI versioning, which is you mentioned the version, which is the V1 orders. Some people also use 1.0 orders, but I typically try to prefer V1 because it's clear it's a version one and not some ID like 1.0 or something. So it's, it's very useful to create your APIs with versions in the URI. I've seen a lot of APIs, public APIs that are really useful, that are used by millions of developers use this kind of versioning. The other type of versioning is using headers where you do the content negotiation and you provide the version number in the header, let's say the content type header. So this way, the client knows what version they are requesting and what type of content they should be expecting. So the idea is to version your APIs right from the beginning because you can't get away with making breaking changes. Let's talk about the last one, but very important one is the filtering and pagination. What does it mean? So APIs should be able to support partial responses using filtering options. So if you talk about get product, getting a product is an operation. Here, it should be my shop slash products. And then you give an ID, which is one to three. Now it responds with all the details of the product one to three, which means it has a name, it has a SKU, prices, description, a lot of things, maybe images, maybe you don't know. So this is the un unfiltered response, but not all clients need everything for a single product, right? So if, imagine you're using a mobile device, which has a limited internet connectivity, limited memory, everything limited, bandwidth is also limited, and you're giving them a huge blob of product details. It's not great because that will slow down the performance. It will degrade the user experience. So you want to give the clients a mechanism, get partial responses and not everything. So the filtered way of doing it would be my shop products one, two, three, and then you provide the fields what you want to get in the response. For example, name, you can also nest it. This can be implemented. I've seen this implemented. It's pretty cool. So you provide name, friendly name, price. It responds with partial results, which is only two fields, the friendly name and the price. And that's what let's say a client needs. They don't have to care about anything else like the product description, which is, which can be huge. 
So this is great way of exposing partial data for a given item. And this saves a lot of processing power, a lot of bandwidth when we are dealing with you know limited bandwidth, limited internet connectivity. So this helps a lot. Now APIs should support pagination for access to a list of items. Now you're not always accessing a single item, but you might be accessing a list of items like get me all products, get me all orders for a customer, get me all devices that are configured, get me all devices that are active, something like that. And then depending on the data size or the si size of the set of items can be really huge. So let's say there are 10,000 products in the, in the shop, which is quite a small shop. And if you just say my shop slash products, get me all products, it can just give you 10,000 products, which is not good. It will create load on your database. It will create load on the client side, on the server side. And it's not very useful as well. So you want to iterate through the results. You want to give them patches of results one at a time so they can process. So pagination should be supported by all the APIs where you're dealing with collection of items. So instead of returning thousands, you just return patch of 100, 200. The limit can be set by the client depending on what kind of data size you're working with. Now there are two types of pagination which are popular, which is offset based and the cursor based. So offset based is very simple. So use offset like the array index, for example, and then you also give the limit or the number of items you expect in the response. So something like my shop products offset zero, you start with zero or the first 200 items, right? So in, in easier terms. So you provide limit 200. So this will give you the first 200 items or the products. And then you can iterate changing the offset to the new offset, which is going to be the sum of the last offset versus the limit and the limit. So this way you can get the next page or the next set of items sequentially. Now it is offset based is used for simple use cases where the list of items is of fixed or predetermined length, but it is not recommended for large data sets and changing size of lists. Now we can get deep into it, but I'm going to create an, another video for understanding the differences and the use cases of offset and cursor based pagination. For now, let's understand that offset is great. It works great for simple use cases, but not great for large data sets. The other one is cursor based. Cursor based pagination, also known as marker based pagination. Instead of using an offset, it uses a cursor. It's just a pointer to the current page or the start of the page. And cursor isn't an offset. It's just an opaque key for the location of the data. And the next marker is provided in the API response because clients cannot really create this marker or the pointer to the next marker. Unlike in offset, where you can just sum it up with the limit or the previous limit, and you can get the next offset, you can't do it with the cursor. So you have to provide the next cursor or the pointer to the next set of pages. So cursor-based is very useful, specifically when length of item list is unknown or it changes often. So you don't have to deal with static offsets you can create dynamic cursors for those. So pagination helps a lot as you can imagine. So REST is great because it's simple. Everyone speaks REST, everyone supports REST, can be extended easily, it's highly scalable. And the best practices we discussed today were API first, resource orientation, plural resource names, versioning of APIs, filtering and pagination. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Also press the bell icon. Thanks a lot and see you in the next video.